Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasala, president of Audioholics, and today we are here with... Hugo Rivera, vice president of marketing. Hugo, great seeing you today. Likewise, my friend. What would you like to discuss? What's on your mind? Well, I think we should definitely share the kind of conversation that we had the other day over lunch, talking about loudspeaker myth. You know, loudspeaker myths is a good topic. Uh, you know we spent many years debunking cable myths, obviously. Yeah. That's kind of what made Audiohawks <laughs> internet well, famous. Yes. <laughs> so, But, you know, I spent a long time looking at loudspeaker manufacturer websites, and I'm looking at their claims, and I'm like, some of this just doesn't seem very logical Absolutely. to me. You know, that's why I have Dr. Spock over here to confirm. Yeah. And some of it is... Not very logical. Some of it is lacking emotion. Mm -hmm. That's why we have Captain Kirk over here, too. Exactly. We're in the middle of the Starship Enterprise here. So here's, here's what I'd like to talk about. Basically, I've come up with a list of things that are on my mind, things mm -hmm. I've seen in the industry. Right. Uh, the first one would be speaker break-in. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, people that don't know what the claim is, the claim is you buy a speaker, and it takes hundreds, sometimes thousands of hours to break in right. to sound <laughs> like a shoe to, like a shoe yeah <laughs> there you go like an old leather piece of shoe exactly right? so it takes thousands of hours to break in mm -hmm. and to get to its optimal performance right well you know we've investigated this phenomenon uh, a year or two ago we actually had a very uh tech savvy guy in the industry that does loudspeaker driver mechanics for a living mm -hmm. did a th two or three part series of articles for us and he examined it we sent him drivers he measured before and after the break-in period right. of running them and the bottom line with that is you know there's some truth a little bit truth to it when you're dealing with high mass drivers like a like a woofer or a subwoofer right you know when you get the driver first out of the box, it's a little stiff. The suspension's stiff. The compliance is stiff. As you start pounding it with music and tones, yeah, it does loosen up a little bit. Right. But it doesn't take thousands of hours. Right. You get a couple of good bass notes into that driver. Within minutes, the driver's broken in. Within minutes. And even the driver does break in, it's swamped out by the box that it's in. The enclosure itself creates the stiffness of the driver. Yeah, right. So any change of fs which is the resonant frequency is usually dwarfed by the enclosure itself mm -hmm. the drivers don't break in when, it, when high frequency drivers like tweeters you know it's kind of a it's a misnomer i think the real reason why a lot of companies stick to this driver break-in or the speaker break-in is basically they want the consumer to live and adapt to the speaker and if you could keep that speaker in the consumer's house more than 30 days you've exceeded the return policy Oh, I see. And, um, you know, generally people do, to some extent, adapt to the sound, and they like the sound over time, and they'll keep it. Well, there you go. So much for uh, getting used to it and the adaptation period, huh? Yeah, I mean, we have a ton of research for those of their propeller heads that want to see the data. <laughs> <laughs> we have it all on our site, and you can check the articles. We'll link them up in the video. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so well, let's go on to the next let's myth. Go, uh, yeah, because we have plenty to cover, let me tell you. Myth number two, Gene. What would that be? Well, this is the big one. This is the big Billy Baru. This is called the double blind test. Oh, boy. And that brings memories of our engineering days. Oh, know? it does, Hugo. You know, um, you know it, it's, a, it's a tough subject because if you talk too much negative about it, people mm -hmm. are going to say, oh, you're anti-double blind test, you're anti-science. That's so not the case. Which we're not. Yeah, I'm totally about science, mm -hmm. but I'm also about applying logical science and, and understanding the meanings of the science Absolutely. and not drawing too many false conclusions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to define the double-blind test, a true double-blind test, not only do the, the, percip the, the uh, participants, the participants mm -hmm. of the double-blind test have to not be aware of the stimulus that's being right. tested, the people running the test have to not be aware of what's being tested, mm -hmm. and the people analyzing the test also have to not be aware of the data they're analyzing. Absolutely. Okay, that's a true double-blind test as applied in the medical field. Yes. And the reason you do a double-blind test is you try to get rid of external stimuli that could bias the results. Like in this case with speakers, the claim is it's the aesthetics, the aesthetics. or the yeah. brand appeal. Exactly. Okay? Now, what I've found is there's very few manufacturers that are actually adhering to a double blind test protocol. At the very best, they're doing a single blind test. They're basically putting the speakers in the room. The manufacturer is running the test, of course, mm -hmm. and they know the speakers that are being tested. Just the listeners might not necessarily know the speakers that are being tested. That's a blind test. 
That's not a double blind test. When you see all these people saying we do double blind tests, even yeah. consumers on the forums, it's not a double blind test. And I think that's a problem that happens across many industries. You know, I've seen it happen in the supplement industry. We saw it happen also in the networks industry as well. That's true. I mean, how many times have we done data for voice quality in the telecom? And, you know, they come up with all these statistics on why something's better than, than something else. And they stretch the truth. Yes. Or they stretch the test conditions. Yes. To meet right. the criteria that they try, to, they try to predisposition before the test yeah, happens. Absolutely. So, the, you know, the other problems with the, with the blind test is um, I've found some manufacturers have actually taken their own employees mm -hmm. to participate in the test. Mm -hmm. And what that does, and this is, a, this is a source of bias that's never discussed and never disclosed, is it creates what's called familiarity bias. Okay, if you're a manufacturer and you know how your speaker sounds, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if there's a screen in front of the speaker, you're going to be able to pick out that speaker blind. Of course. Years Absolutely. ago, you know, years ago, we did a shootout of, uh, of a bunch of different floor standing speakers. Mm -hmm. And I had inexperienced listeners and trained listeners in, in my sound studio. And the experienced listener, I watched his results because he knows how these certain speakers sound. I told him the brands that were in it. He was able to identify the brand of the speaker every time behind the blind screen because he knows that this brand has a certain sonic signature. Right. That brand has a certain sonic signature. Everybody has their own little flavor. Yes, of course. And if you if you're experienced listening to speakers for you know 15, 20 years like we are, you pick up on that. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So you know the phenomenon I always laugh at is when you look at some of the marketing literature from these companies. Everybody wins their own blind test. Yeah. <laughs> Could it be a coincidence? <laughs> it, it, I don't think so. And it's not only that, not only do they win their own blind test, at the very minimum, they're similarly good. Okay? <laughs> so they claim their $500 speaker is similarly as good as a $10,000 speaker. Mm -hmm. They set themselves up in a situation where they never lose. Mm -hmm. And... And uh, basically, they try, to de they try to downplay the fact that there are differences in speakers that could be heard. Mm -hmm. And price, yeah, price may not always be an in indication of quality. Absolutely. But again, you're generalizing. How many speakers have they actually tested? You know, have, they, have these companies actually gone out and sampled a large supply of the different brands and prices to, no. see, to make these conclusions? Knowing the budgets of most companies, I would very much doubt so. You know, you're absolutely right. And I've even spoken to very large speaker companies. And, and, you know, when they made these conclusions, I said, well, have you tested this speaker, that speaker? No, it's not in our budget to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you're just making these white papers based on the fact that you're saying price doesn't matter, yet your sample size that you're basing these conclusions on... It's too small. ...is, is statifi statistically <laughs> insignificant. Uh, absolutely. That's the problem. So that's something you really have to watch out for. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, this is something that I've seen in many, many industries, you know. Uh, sample size not big enough, you know. That's the first thing we learn in statistics. You need a sample size that is significant, that, that is significant you know. The other thing, too, is uh, when you look at how some of these tests are run, um, you know, the argument is you want to run the test in mono because you don't, if you right. run a test in stereo, you get combing effects of the two speakers. You lose the phantom image if the speakers aren't properly towed in. I understand that logic, but my, my counter to that is if you make a test that's too robotic in nature, you get robotic results. Yes, of course. Okay, we don't listen to just one speaker sitting in the center mm -hmm. of the room. Mm -hmm. I actually listen to see how a pair of speakers image. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're setting it up to that point where... It's such a sterile environment, you know, there's so many, there's, there's acoustical issues to mm -hmm. worry about, mm -hmm. positional issues. Yeah. The other thing too, Gene, is that, you know, I got to believe everybody's perception of sound is a little bit different, you know. Some people may appreciate certain things a little bit better than others, you know. I agree with you on that, and that's why there's 400 brands of speakers on the market. Um, you know, I will give credit, there's some great science that has been done, um, you know, back in the NRC days, in the, you know, in the early 90s, Dr. Floyd Tool was out there. He set up a very controlled way of actually doing real double-blind tests of speakers. And he correlated, you know, a, a speaker has to have a certain characteristic of measurements, mm -hmm. very flat on, on axis performance, very graduated off axis performance to create a good balance of sound in a real room. Mm -hmm. And he correlated with pretty good results how a speaker measures to what people would prefer, especially mm -hmm. if, the, if the listeners are trained listeners and they understand right. you know, the colorations that exist in speakers. 
And that's some pioneering work that was done 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but it's not the whole picture. And um, a lot of companies try to take that research as if they did it themselves too. They didn't. You know, this stuff was started by Dr. Toole, headed up by Sean Olive as well, and it continues at Harmon today. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the few guys that really have a good science on understanding perceptual differences right. in sound. They actually have a program you could download for free to help train you to become a better listener. It's excellent. And um, I, I enjoy that program because it helps you see the colorations in music. Mm -hmm. But again, um, it's important to recognize there are limitations. Uh, the NRC work was great. It, it developed a listening window response that you can measure. It developed, you know, basic, very basic distortion tests. But the problem with their distortion tests were, is um, you're basically testing distortion like it's an amplifier, mm -hmm. when it's an actual loudspeaker transducer. And how we perceive sound through a loudspeaker is much more complicated. And there's really no algorithm that can predict loudspeaker distortion to what we prefer. Sure. That's the problem. And, you know, th that leads to other sets of issues, too, because when you're dealing with loudspeakers, if you don't have a way to quantify the measurements of, of what we prefer, mm -hmm. you could run into that trap of overgeneralizing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, I've, I've measured speakers. I've had speakers come in that are supposedly NRC compliant, mm -hmm. like they meet all these criteria, right, to mm -hmm. have great on-axis response, low distortion. I get a speaker that comes in, you saw it last week, no crossover on the mid -range. Yes. What does that do? The, the speaker's running out of band, it's breaking up, it's causing all sorts of audible distortion. Yeah. And you might not see it on a frequency response graph, but man, when you start measuring these speakers, you know, if, if you start measuring the, each driver playing on its own and you start really analyzing the sound, you realize there's a lot of flawed logic that went behind this design. Right, right. And it's because they overgeneralized conclusions and they didn't use a little common sense when they were making the design. And it's all about cutting costs. Yes. And I think a lot of the research that's done that makes these generalizations is done to defend making the speaker cheaper. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, I'll give you an example. You got this speaker right here. Now, this is a, a no, no cost, cost no object design, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a crazy over engineered design, the kind of stuff I love. Yes. As an engineer, I always, I don't look for a way to make things cheaper. I look for a way to make things the best regardless the best. of price. I don't care that's, about the price. As close to perfection as possible. Right. Yeah. So, in this Understood. case, in this case, you know, you want to make a speaker that has no resonance in the cabinet, mm -hmm. right? And there's ways to measure resonance. You could use an accelerometer. You know, Harman uses a laser vibrometer where they mm -hmm. put it in an anechoic chamber and measure 360 degrees around. Mm -hmm. But Or you can make a cabinet that's so inert, any way you tap on it, that there's just nowhere for the energy to <laughs> that's transfer. <it. laughs> I mean, this is a solid granite cabinet, fully braced inside. This is a crazy expensive speaker. Yes. But my point is I didn't need an anechoic chamber to make an inert cabinet. No, correct. Okay, this is an overkill design. It's a super solid design. Mm -hmm. It's got a narrow baffle, you know, so you've got excellent off-axis performance. It basically has all the criteria that you would get from an NRC-compliant speaker. Right. But it's over-designed. Okay. It's got very good drivers, very good crossover so integration. Um, no, no skimping on bandwidth limiting the drivers when you should bandwidth limit them. Right. And, uh, you know, that... That brings us up to another point that we should discuss is crossovers. Crossover. Mm -hmm. Because the crossover inside of a speaker is something that you don't often, you don't hardly ever get to see. It's inside the speaker. Right. And that's where manufacturers like to skimp a lot. Either because they're doing it for cost savings or because they lack the understanding of properly integrating a speaker. Mm -hmm. And the argument is, well, you know, better parts don't matter. Well, yeah, better parts don't matter if you're starting out with a bad design to begin with. Yeah. Of course. But part quality does matter, like anything in engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're using electrolytic capacitors in a, in a, in a, in a uh, crossover, electrolytic capacitors have a lot of series resistance. Mm -hmm. They're very nonlinear at high frequency, mm -hmm. so it creates an uneven sound. Right. Uh, iron core chokes, they have hysteresis effects, which adds to distortion. Mm -hmm. So you want to use air core when you can. Mm -hmm. You know, usually on the mid-range drivers and higher, you go to air core. You can do iron chokes on the base drivers because they're a larger value. But you have to make sure that they don't saturate. You have to make sure you over-design that part, mm -hmm. too. So the better parts do matter, but even more important than the better parts is proper execution. Of course. Of course. And integration of all the parts and everything. And, yeah, and you, know, and, you know, the myth is you need an anechoic chamber to measure a speaker and to design a speaker. That's nonsense. I mean, an anechoic chamber is extremely useful. I'm not downplaying the usefulness of an anechoic chamber. You can pull a ton of measurements quickly 
because you don't have to worry about room effects. Right. But an experienced transducer engineer or a designer knows how to gate those room effects out. They could use various techniques. You could use ground plane measurements. Mm -hmm. You put the speaker on the floor, you measure the bass response. Mm -hmm. You can measure it outdoors in a very large, almost like a four pi environment, which is anechoic, and you could pull your data there too. So I really believe when companies say you have to have an anechoic chamber to design a speaker, they're saying that because they already have the anechoic chamber and they're trying to differentiate the product from their competitor. Sure, understandable. And that's really what, it, when, when, you, you know, when you're looking at a market that has 400 brands. You gotta differentiate somehow. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. What's the next myth, Gene? Well, you know, just thinking about some other stuff. Um, back to the cabinet bracing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we go back to the speaker, we talked about how rigid this cabinet is. Right. There's some companies that say, oh, you want to use less bracing. You want to lower the panel resonance. And again, this is a way to cheapen the product. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the bottom line is because why would you want a cabinet to resonate in the bandwidth that the drivers are operating? Okay. No so, sense. So if you've got a woofer that's operating at, you know, from 20 to 150 hertz, you put less bracing and you knock on the cabinet, it sounds like a hollow box. Yeah. You're exciting that resonance <laughs> within the driver's bandwidth. It's a boom box. It's a boom. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what happens a lot. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. I, I got in a pair of speakers from a very large speaker mm -hmm. company, very well respected company. And they were making these marketing claims that their $800 speaker is as good or better or similarly good as a $4,000 competitor. So I had all these high expectations. Oh my God, these guys are applying the NRC science. They have all the anechoic data. Um, they have all this literature that shows the correlation. So I'm like, this is gonna be a kick ass speaker. I can't wait, it's gonna be revolutionary. I can't wait yeah. to write it about it to our readers. So I, I put the speakers in the room and you know I, I hooked them up and I'm listening and I'm listening. I'm like, you know, they're a pleasing sounding speaker. They've got Decent, but not very deep bass. Mm -hmm. They've got good mid-range. The rash. They're a little bit stringy and edgy. And I'm thinking, and there's a little bit boom. I'm like, what's going on here? So I'm like, well, I don't like to measure a speaker before I listen because I don't want to bias my right. listening results with what I measured. Mm -hmm. So I take the speaker apart. <laughs> and I, I find the tweeter. They're using like a little car audio tweeter. It's like a $2 tweeter with a neodymium magnet on it. It's like the nice. cheapest tweeter you can use, right? They're using, not only is it the wrong impedance, it's a 4-ohm tweeter in an 8-ohm system. The reason why they were doing that, Hugo, is because when you put a low impedance tweeter in a high-ohm system like that, you're increasing sensitivity. Mm. You're, you're inflating how efficient the speaker is, okay? Understood. So they're using this cheap tweeter, they're putting a horn on it to give it more sensitivity again, another method of compromise. There's no bracing in the cabinet, very little. There's almost no dampening in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, okay, this company has all this science about reducing resonances, about making a speaker that could win on a blind test, yet they're making a speaker as cheaply as possible using some of the lowest grade, lowest grade parts. And the sum of the speaker is based on what the parts are in it. I mean, it's like that with any industry, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you think to yourself, well, there has to be some type of breakdown again between the research and the actual product that marketing is allowing going through the company. And you're wondering how much of the research is trickling into the actual product. That's a big question. Absolutely. Because I, when you go ahead and listen to it, you're not convinced that the research is trickling. <laughs> I, exactly. And, you know, I don't want to put any companies on the spot, but you look at a company like Bose, for example. Mm -hmm. Audiophiles hate Bose. Mm -hmm. But the general consumer loves Bose. Absolutely. I've never met one person who's a general consumer that doesn't love them. You'll never do. You'll never do it. And Bose is an incredibly brilliant company. What Bose does is they market their science to the general public, not to the audiophile. So they make a lifestyle product for the general public and they shroud it in science. Yeah. And, you know, I got doctors... I'm getting a back procedure done. The guy's injecting a needle in my back. He's asking me what I think about bows. I'm like, I don't really want to talk about this while I'm getting a needle. So my, my point is right. I'll let the reader or the viewer decide how much science they think trickles into the product right. based on what they see. You make your own decision. Make your own decision because I'm not going to bash bows. I'm just going to make the point clear mm -hmm. that everyone has a market that they cater to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think a lot of people, to be quite honest with you, Gene, you know, they, they hear the research and the, when they listen to the product, it's almost like they're not even listening to what's coming out. They're just 
rationalizing oh, the yeah. research. Yes. And that's, you know, it must be good. Well, I'll tell you, good. and I'll tell you, when we go to the trade shows, especially with the guys that do room EQ uh, for, you know, for like receivers and stuff, they try to precondition the listener before they ever sit down. And I have to tell them when I sit down with my wife, I'm like, please don't tell us what we're going to hear. Don't tell us what we expect to hear. Let us just sit down and, and, and determine it for ourselves. Absolutely. Because the mind is very suggestible. Absolutely. Well, there's such thing as a placebo effect. You know this. Exactly. You know? So I think the placebo effect applies to uh, loudspeakers as well. It applies to everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, you know there's, some all, there's some other myths I'd like to discuss, too, is... Um, uh, one of them I, I like to discuss is when companies say they make their own drivers. Again, it's a good one. Again, this is another way to make yourself look exclusive in a small shrinking market with many competition, mm -hmm. many brands, right? Mm -hmm. And there are companies that do, to some extent, make their own drivers. You know, there's companies that have a very specific need if they make like a coaxial speaker that there's off-the-shelf part doesn't meet. Yeah, then they can spec it. They either OEM it or they set up a facility to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. But the claim that you make your own drivers for consistency or better sound is, to me, another fallacy. Because what does that tell you? That tells me you're insulting these companies that do nothing all day long but make drivers. Mm -hmm. You know, you got really high-end companies, Vifa, Cias, um, all these different brands, Focal, another mm -hmm. one. These guys are acoustical engineer experts. They live and die by making drivers. They know how to measure them. They know how to manufacture them. Um, so to say that these guys can't make a driver consistent is a, just a bunch of BS to me. Now, a lot of these companies, what they do is they don't actually make their own drivers, Hugo. What they do is they call up these companies. They'll call up Vifa, for example, say, hey, I need a um, silk dome one-inch tweeter that can handle 100 watts, and I need it in a six-ohm impedance. Vifo will come back and say, well, we have that. We have every criteria you meet, but it's an 8-ohm. But we could wind the voice coil to make it a 6-ohm. Mm -hmm. Done. That's my own driver. I just <laughs> made my own driver. <laughs> or can we take your off-the-shelf part and put our nameplate on it? Mm -hmm. Sure, we can put your nameplate on it. Or can we put a metal faceplate on it? We could do that too. There, boom, I have my own driver. Now I can sell that to the reader. Hey, we got our own drivers. <laughs> We've customized it. <laughs> You know what, Gene, that happens in the supplement industry all the time. <laughs> all the time. Customized formula. Oh, we created it, this and that. When yeah. you go ahead and take a look at it, it's just one phone call, man. That's it. So manufacturer puts it together, they individualize it a little bit based on the requirements of the company. Pss, done. Proprietary formula. Yep. That's it. <laughs> I hear you. So same thing here. But it's marketing. Yes, and then you know there's the uh, there's another myth that I've noticed, um, and this is this happens not just with speakers but with everything, right? The constantly I call it the constantly evolving speaker. Yes. Okay. A company comes out with a speaker. Let's call it the the Z100. Mm -hmm. Okay. They come out with the Z100. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Twenty third century sort of uh, technology. technology. Yeah, it's got nano probes. In it, <laughs> yeah. Right? It's so they come out with this great speaker. It's got all this drive technology that didn't exist five years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two years later, they come out with the Z100 version 2. <laughs> all of a sudden, it's reinvented. It's the same driver topology, the same cabinet, but they might have tweaked something. Maybe they made the, to maybe they made the dome tweeter gold color instead of <laughs> silver. Or maybe they put a little bit of a bigger magnet on the woofer. Something, something to make it stand out a little bit. But it's version 2.0, Gene. It must be better. It must be better. Now, you know... I like progress, and yes, there's something to be said about coming out with new versions, coming out, you know, maybe fixing design flaws that were in the product that people didn't, you know, the, the engineers didn't realize mm -hmm. at the time. That's fine. But if a company is coming out with a new version like every year, speaker technology is not like the electronics industry. It doesn't change no. that much, man. A good speaker design 10 years ago is mm -hmm. still a good speaker today. Yeah. So <laughs> take that with a grain of salt. I, I really think sometimes companies come up with these versions so quickly is if they get a bad review mm -hmm. in the press, well, now you can exonerate all that because, well, that was the old version. Yeah, exactly. We have a new version that fixes this resonant problem. <laughs> or if they want to increase the price, mm -hmm. well, we have to increase our price now because we made all these product improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they do increase their price on their speakers, you have to look at the rest of their product lines. If they increase the price on their other products... That's a good question, right? If yeah. they're only increasing the price on the new versions and not increasing on everything else, then maybe their production costs didn't go up. Maybe they're just looking for a way to eke out more perform or more profit. More profit, yep. Profit margin's higher. 
that's what version 2.0 is about. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, all right, that's, well, that's perfect. You know, you know? The last thing I'd let, I, I think we should talk about, it's not as much of an issue as it was maybe 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. ago, the, the digital speaker. I, oh, yeah. I, when I, back in the days when we used to work at, at our telecom company, mm -hmm. I would go to eat lunch, and, and these guys would pull up in a white van, <laughs> and they would try to sell. Usually they would target women, Yeah. but I would love to just get involved in that, right? Me too. So I would, do, I would go in and listen, and these guys would come up and say, hey, I got these speakers. They fell off a truck. Yeah. My boss has to get rid of them. He doesn't know I got them. You know, buy them. Yeah, I'll give them their $1,000 speakers. They, have, they even have the literature. This is like yeah. a multi-million dollar business, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we'll sell it to you for $200. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a scam. Yes. Okay. And, and you can tell the scam, number one, never buy a speaker from a white van. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> number two, if the speaker has the words digital on it, it's probably a scam. With the exception today of like the iPod docs that have digital interfaces, but to say a speaker's digital ready is nonsense. Mm -hmm. So just be, avoid, just be aware of the scams. And, uh, you know, that's, don't buy a speaker from a man, please. Yeah, don't. You know, any van that opens up its door, you know, you may want to stay away from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. General rule. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Gene, you know, what what is the take home message here? Well, you know, yeah, let's recap because we talked about a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, you know, I just want to say, if anything, that understand that everybody has their science. And not all science is equal for each company. And not all the science that they allegedly have is applied to product. You know, that's, you got to realize everybody's selling you. They're trying to make their products look different. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have to be different in a shrinking market with too many, com too many competitors. Mm -hmm. And don't necessarily think that you're going to get a better product from a large corporation that has all the science versus a small company that's building, you know, a mom and pop shop that's building speakers. There are small companies that are very passionate about what they do. They're very passionate. And also some of these companies aren't so much concerned about as the profit as much True. as they are about making a, pro a product of passion. Don't assume that an internet direct speaker is a better deal than a brick and mortar that you buy from a retail chain because that's not the case. We found many times that's not the case. There's no fixed profit margin, whether you're internet direct or you're through legit uh, through uh, traditional yeah traditional sales channels. Mm -hmm. It's just not the case. Right. Um, the other thing I'd say is you know look at the science, respect it. I really respect the stuff that was done at the NRC. I respect the stuff that's still going on today at Horman. But realize we're not robots. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And and. Um, you could say that a look would bias you, or you know a cosmetic or a brand appeal. But you know what? Maybe some of there's some shred of truth to that, but at the same time, you have to live with the product too. Mm -hmm. Not only do you have to have a product that sounds good, you should have a product that looks good too, that you could be happy to have in your house. I think that's part of the purchasing process, to be honest with you. Otherwise, otherwise we would all have crappy cars. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, you know, the funny thing about cars is they say you have to do a blind test. We're back to the blind test again. You have to do a blind test to eliminate variables with speakers. How come nobody's saying that in the car industry? How come when you go and test drive a Porsche and compare it to a Corvette, we're not blindfolding ourselves on that, are we? <laughs> that will bring some catastrophic results. <laughs> Insurance companies would have problems with that. So, For sure. Yeah. So I, there you go. That's a great message to go ahead and uh, drive to our viewers over here. Yeah, you know, I hope it creates a discussion in our forums and on Facebook that, you know, people just understand that there's more than one way to skin a cat. Absolutely. Okay, and, and the science is great to have, but you don't always have correlations in real world with the scientific and, results. And I think we've seen that in many disciplines, Gene. I mean, if you go ahead and look, for example, at, uh, you know, our telecom uh, sort of uh, experience, how many times we had a, a perfect mathematical model, everything was working perfectly in that lab, we tried everything imaginable to go ahead and have the best test results possible and when you try the technology out in the field crash crashed and burned yeah. totally yeah. and we see the same thing also gene in uh in the supplement industry as well sometimes you know the research is good it looks great in the lab it worked in the mice right and then when you go ahead and you try it <laughs> out <laughs> the mice got jacked it got muscular you didn't get a thing Okay, right. it, it is what it is. Super mouse. <laughs> Super mouse, you know. Good for the mouse. It didn't work for you. That's it, you know. Yes. I mean, you got to take a look at things. Does it work in the real world, you know? Is it something that 
it's pleasing to you. And I think that's a personal choice at the end of the day, you know. Amen to that. So, excellent. Anything else you want to cover, team? I think we're, we pretty much used up all of our camera battery on this one. <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, you know, thank you so much for uh, taking a look at our videos. And uh, if you click, if you like the video, feel free to click like on the button below and also share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, Google+. Comment on it. Let us know what you think. And furthermore, don't forget to visit our website at www.audioholics.com for tons of free information and tons of uh, reviews on various products out there. Really the best reviews. I mean, I, I don't Thank mean you. to sound biased, but uh, this guy is amazing at reviewing things. It's, and the people just, that write for us. Absolutely. You know, the, the staff is just incredible, super passionate people. And uh, furthermore, I just want to go ahead and say that, you know, don't forget to sign up to our newsletter. And when you sign up to our newsletter, not only you get some very special promotions that are not advertised on the site, but you also get our free uh, top uh, 2014 AB Gear Guide. You want to talk a little bit about that, Gene? Yeah, absolutely. Basically, we've come up with a very concise PDF format of the top picks in, in AV gear that we've taken a look at this year, whether it's speakers, uh, subwoofers, receivers, Blu-ray players, and we put it in a nice concise guide that you can download and you can use it as a reference. Yeah, you can print it out and take it to the uh, store and uh, you'll be all set. Anyways, thank you so much again and uh, keep listening. That's right, keep listening blind and sighted. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> and don't drive blindly. <laughs> Bye.